For all its beauty and splendor, the wilderness can be a cruel teacher. Mountaineering is not an easy activity, nor is it without danger. That's why, although there are no official global rules to mountaineering, mountaineers hold three golden rules as their mantra. It's always farther than it looks, it's always taller than it looks, and it's always harder than it looks. It's a difficult and risky sport, but a very rewarding activity. Most people choose to climb test their limits and dare go where very few human beings have stood before as long as you're well prepared and you don't underestimate the activity. Click the subscribe and like buttons. This is Outdoor Disasters. Denali, once called Mount McKinley, the Great One, is the tallest peak in North America and one of the largest massifs in the world. The 20,000-foot gargantuan mountain dominates the horizon like nothing else, a dazzling white behemoth that can be seen from all over south-central Alaska. It is the third highest of the seven summits, the highest mountains on each of the seven continents, following Mount Everest in Nepal and Aconcagua in Argentina. The highest mountain is determined by measuring a mountain's highest point above sea level. Astonishingly, when measuring Denali from its base to its peak at 18,000 feet, it is the tallest mountain on the surface, taller than Mount Everest from its base, which is 17,000 feet. Denali and Everest are both dwarfed by Mauna Kea in Hawaii at 33,000 feet tall, but only a 4,000 foot rise above sea level. Its amazing size, beauty, and remoteness attract climbers from around the world. Climbing Denali successfully is an accomplishment as impressive as it is memorable. It's on every climber's bucket list. For Mike Helms, Bob Candico, Simon McCartney, and Jack Roberts, their ascent of Denali would be a memorable story of survival and heroism. The story begins in late May 1980, just days after the eruption of Mount St. Helens. Talkeetna is ground zero for American alpinism, and Bob Candico was a part of that scene. After two years of graduate school, Bob is living in a VW camper van full of dirtbag gear and climbing magazines. A recent convert to climbing, he had two summer seasons under his belt with ascents in the Canadian Rockies, Selkirks, and St. Elias Ranges, and was hungry for the bigger stage. The best opportunity was to talk his way onto a team that was ascending Denali. He was able to, but had to wait for good weather. A few days later, early in the morning, the clouds thinned, revealing the rose-tinted hue of sunrise striking the summit of the highest peak in North America, meaning flights to the Glacier Base Camp on Denali would commence today. Bob and his new team of climbers were off to conquer the Great Denali. The flight into the Alaska Range from Talkeetna offered views that transitioned quickly from treeless bogs to jagged granite peaks rising out of rivers of ice. I almost fell onto my knees in awe as I gawked at the dozen peaks that soared a vertical mile out of the ice. Each single peak was more magnificent and daunting than any I had previously seen. We had a month to climb them all. This would be Nirvana. But Nirvana had to wait, as one low-pressure system after another hurled clouds laden with wet snow against the peaks. Elation turned to gloom. Endless card games were played to alleviate the boredom of tent life in inclement weather. After 12 days spent mostly in damp, clammy sleeping bags, Bob's new climbing partners announced they were giving up and heading back. Bob was devastated. With no reason to head home, and in truth, no home to head to, I resorted to visiting other tents on the glacier, in hopes of finding a new climbing partner, Bob says. As luck would have it, the first tent Bob visited held Mike Helms, an outdoor gear designer and guide from Olympia. His two friends had also decided to fly out early. After a brief introduction, climbing skills and history were shared, Bob would team up with Mike for an attempt at the highest peak in North America. From their new camp, the route would deviate from the normal climber's route, which ascended the less technical west buttress. They would take the Cassin Ridge, considered one of the premier technical climbs in North America. Their strategy was to move in one push, carrying everything for the climb up 8,000 feet of steep ice and granite rock cliffs, and then descend via the standard west buttress route. This alpine-style ascent of the Cassin Ridge had been only been attempted a few times before 1980. As average journeyman climbers, they were setting their goals to the highest standard. To attempt such a route with a total stranger might seem like a reckless decision, but to Mike and Bob, it was simply a challenge not to be missed. And off are Mike and Bob climbing one of the most majestic mountains in the world. 
On their ascent, they ran into two other climbers who had even loftier ambitions. They decided to camp together for the night. Jack Roberts and Simon McCartney were attempting to ascend the unclimbed mile-high wall on the southwest face. With climbing resumes that included the north face of the Eiger in winter, ascents of El Capitan walls in Yosemite, and first ascents of audacious and dangerous faces in the Alps and the Alaska Range, they were the climbers that they aspired to be. They were the elite. Their cockiness and charisma were infectious. Mike and Bob were truly awed to be in the company of some of the top climbers in the world. Three days later, with clearing weather, the four of them left the glacier campsite at 12,000 feet. Bob takes a moment to turn and sees Jack and Simon's footsteps leading to the base of their daunting objective. For eight days, Bob and Mike traversed up the Cassin Ridge. More severe than they anticipated, the route challenged the two in every aspect with its steep ice and vertical steps up the granite cliffs. After an exhausting day of 12 hours of climbing, they were fortunate to find a narrow ledge on which to erect their tent. Before succumbing to much needed sleep, Bob and Mike silently struggled with the doubt. But there was no retreat in their plan. Bob lay awake, quivering with fear as gusts of wind thrashed the single layer of fabric comprising their shelter. Their ascent rate slowed considerably as Bob struggled to adjust to the altitude. His brain, starved for oxygen, was functioning on a several second delay mode. They decided to take an unscheduled rest day to allow time for Bob to acclimatize. The following day, they made a miraculous discovery of two gallons of cooking gas stashed from an earlier expedition, a welcome replenishment of their dwindling supply. None of these circumstances were unusual for alpinists on difficult routes. Both Mike and Bob had read inspirational accounts of such climbs, but struggling in the reality of such tenuous circumstances was vastly different than reading articles in glossy magazines. Meanwhile, the climb was going well for Simon McCartney and Jack Roberts. The ascent consisted of rock and mixed climbing at a high technical standard for several days. Some days, the duo erected a small bivouac tent. Other nights were spent sitting out in the open, but by day eight, at around 17,000 feet, Simon's condition became worrying. He became uncoordinated and was slurring his words. On day nine, they made the junction at the Cassin Ridge route at 18,000 feet. They kept climbing through the night, hoping to reach the summit of the mountain. But McCartney's condition was continually worsening as they gained altitude. Somewhere above 19,000 feet, they were forced to stop. Roberts managed to cut out a ledge in the ice for their bivy tent, but by then, they were out of food. They still had some fuel left for their stove to melt snow. They had to descend first thing in the morning, but the following day, their 10th, the weather was too bad to move. On day 11, the weather was bad again, and Roberts had to keep digging their tent out, whereas Simon was by then completely helpless, suffering from edema. In 1980, not as much was known about acclimatization, and being high for so long in such a condition could mean death. On day 12, the weather finally improved, but they had no way of signaling for a rescue. And in any case, they were too high for a helicopter lift off. Roberts began to realize his feet were frostbitten and decided their only hope of rescue was for him to climb solo over the summit and down the west flank and hope for a meeting with a climbing party. He realized Simon's chances of survival were small, so he made him list his immediate family and friends to contact and for him to say his goodbyes. He was prepared to leave, but stopped outside the tent, unable to take the first step and leave his stricken comrade. With calm winds and an azure blue sky overhead, Mike Helms and Bob Kandiko departed their campsite on a tiny platform chiseled on the ridge crest at 18,000 feet, taking their first steps towards the summit, just 2,000 feet above them. The negative 40 degree cold was piercing, but the sun offered an illusion of warmth. The view stretched out over the surrounding peaks to the distant Gulf of Alaska. Their ascent was even more labored at this point, step after grueling step. Bob's altimeter watch recorded an elevation of 19,000 feet. Step, inhale, Bob whispers to himself. Suddenly they hear a voice. They looked up slope and were amazed to see a lone figure jumping and shouting beside a tent. It took them a painfully long 30 minutes of kicking steps to finally reach Jack Roberts and to learn that his climbing partner Simon was semi-conscious in the tent, disabled by cerebral edema.
This swelling of the tissues of the brain is caused by a rapid ascent in altitude and is worsened by dehydration. They had been successful in completing their very difficult climb, but had run out of fuel and subsequently had no way to melt snow for much needed water. Jack's toes were black with frostbite, and they had not eaten in days. The four of them were 800 vertical feet below the summit on the remote south face, with no radio and only two meager freeze-dried dinners between them. What took place in the next 20 minutes changed the lives of the four men. A decision had to be made. One climber was disabled, one had frostbite, and the other two were weakened by their arduous ascent. Bob and Mike's mental cognition was less than ideal as a result of the altitude and exhaustion. But in those 20 minutes, they worked out what seemed to be our best option. Mike had been on the West Buttress route previously, so he had knowledge of the way down. There would certainly be other climbers on that route. Jack had knowledge of technical rescue systems, but his frostbite was severe. Jack proposed that Mike and he would ascend over the top, descend until they encountered other climbers, retrace their steps to the ridge above to lower ropes to Bob and Simon, and pull them over the top. Mike did not want to split away from Bob, but Bob volunteered to stay with Simon. He moves into the tent with Simon, took all the fuel and meager scraps of food, gave Jack a short note to Bob's mother, and then watched them kick step upward. The two days that Simon and Bob waited on Casson Ridge were agonizing as the reality of their situation sunk in. They were completely isolated on the steepest and most remote face of the highest peak in North America. Simon was incapacitated. They were out of rations. After realizing the only chance of survival was to make an attempt to evacuate themselves, Bob and Simon suited up to attempt the final ascent to the summit ridge. Bob carried most of the weight, but Simon simply dropped to his knees, unable to stand upright due to his cerebral edema. Bob jerked tight on the rope, attempting to haul him uphill, but he collapsed in tears. The thought of untying the rope and heading up alone crossed Bob's mind, but he could not leave Simon to die. Their only choice was unthinkable, to descend the length of Cassin Ridge without food and with no gear except a single rope. Meanwhile, Mike Helms and Jack Roberts continued up to within a short distance of the summit and then started down the west buttress route. But they would have more bad weather, along with difficulty getting reception, once they met another climbing party with a radio. In addition, another climber in distress had to be rescued, and Helms and Robert stepped in to assist. They were far from getting back to assist Bob and Simon. That descent for Bob Condico and Simon McCartney started with Simon sliding on the snow as Bob tethered him with the rope. Grueling days of plunge stepping, rappelling, and at times crawling downward. On the third day, they heard the unmistakable sound of an airplane overhead and saw a plane through the clouds. With renewed optimism, Bob stamped out the word HELP in six-foot-long letters in the snow and positioned the climbing rope in an X's to mark a possible landing spot for a rescue helicopter. This location was one of the few sites on the ridge where a helicopter might be able to land, so Bob did not want to descend further. In clear skies and calm winds, they waited. Minutes turned into hours, longing to hear the throb of an approaching helicopter. As evening approached, their enthusiasm evaporated. They set up their tent and crawled into their cold bags, and without words spoken, accepted that their ordeal was not to end with a quick exit. Tonight would be another without food. In the morning, Bob and Simon continued down the steepest section of the Cassin Ridge, the lack of food and extreme exertion had caused their urine to become a rust orange color. At one point they discovered used tea bags in the snow at the site of an old campsite and consumed them. They even resorted to toothpaste soup, but they never lost hope. Then they found two coils of climbing ropes cached on a ledge, enabling them to rappel down places they could not down climb. Still they grew weaker and weaker. Then, when they were totally spent and had not more to give, four climbers from Pennsylvania appeared and came to their aid. The Pennsylvanians shared their food and tent and assisted them down the lower technical section, thereby sacrificing their own summit opportunity. As they reached the main glacier, Simon and Bob, barely able to walk by now, slipped and tumbled over an unseen ice cliff. Simon fell 50 feet, plunging into a crevasse, breaking his wrist and giving him a concussion. Instead of walking down the remainder of the glacier, he was loaded into a rescue toboggan for an all-night sledding to an airstrip. 
After more delays because of poor weather, McCartney was finally taken by helicopter to Anchorage. By this time, he had more medical issues on top of the edema. A broken wrist and concussion suffered the fall into the crevasse. Sadly, just before Bob was rescued off the mountain, he talked with four climbers who had just arrived and were excited to head up the Cassin Ridge. He learned later that summer that they were never seen again, probably victims of an avalanche. At about the same time, Mike Helms and Jack Roberts reached a place where Roberts could be airlifted to an Anchorage hospital to receive treatment for his frostbitten feet. Mike was desperate to learn the fates of Bob Candico and Simon McCartney, but he found out from search and rescue that they were rescued and were on their way to the hospital. Once I found out they were down, I caught the next flight to Talkeetna, Mike said. I was drained physically, mentally, and emotionally. I was done. More than three decades later, Mike would recall that when back he looked back at Bob and Simon, he thought that he would never see them again. What happened on Denali back in 1980 had profound and lasting effects on the four men, albeit in different ways. Simon McCartney needed about a year to recover from his injuries, and by then, he had decided to give up climbing. I had no desire to go back in the mountains and climb things that were easier than my capabilities, he said. I also came to realize that I'd probably be killed if I attempted to do something harder than Denali. The prospects for survival weren't good, so I quit. It was very, very hard to do. It left a big hole in my life, he stated. McCartney was an accomplished climber in Europe and North America and was walking away. He expressed the gratitude he feels for Mike Helms and Bob Candico. It is very hard to verbalize. How do I feel about Mike and Bob? It's indescribable. I mean, those guys put themselves in harm's way that I might have a chance to survive. After returning from Alaska in 1980, Bob Candico continued to have a very active climbing career and still loves climbing. As for Helms, he continued climbing for a few years after Denali, and then he also gave up climbing. For most of the next 35 years, this story of selfless valor remained largely untold. Fortunately, there is no statute of limitations for acts of mountaineering heroism. Simon McCartney, who escaped death on Denali in 1980 thanks to the rescue efforts of Mike Helms and Bob Candico, has written a book about that climb and others he made with his late climbing friend Jack Roberts, who died in a 2012 Colorado climbing accident. So in January 2016, the American Alpine Club honored Mike Helms and Bob Candico with its prestigious David Sowles Memorial Award. According to a club statement, the honor is given to mountaineers who have distinguished themselves by going to the assistance of fellow climbers imperiled in the mountains. What Helms and Candico did on Denali was an epic rescue and one of the great stories of Alaska climbing history, American Alpine Club executive editor Dougald MacDonald said. It is, he added, high time they get more recognition for their brave efforts. For Helms, who was 66 at the time of the award ceremony, the award brought a secondary, but no less meaningful, benefit. In the years since that fateful climb, during which the four men had virtually no contact with each other, he continued to think he should have done something different, something more. Though no lives were lost, the memory of what happened on Denali was always, for Helms, tainted with regret. But when Mike Helms, Bob Candico, Jack's widow Pam Roberts, and Simon McCartney reunited for the ceremony, the three surviving climbers and Jack's wife have been able to reconnect, communicate, and bring closure to what was a watershed event in their lives. Climbing is dangerous, but the high of conquering a peak is indescribable. Nothing really beats mountain climbing for an all-natural adventure. You get a spectacular view and a spectacular story. Whether you've decided to stick to a heavily trafficked peak or find somewhere a bit farther away from society, there's something in it for everyone. With the thrill that comes from such an extreme form of recreation comes a whole host of dangers. It is the responsibility of anyone climbing a mountain to know the dangers and take steps to prepare accordingly. To navigate the dangers so you can make it to the top and back down, you need to do everything you can to mitigate the effects of gravity and falling. Redundancy is key. Always back up every important piece of gear with another piece of gear and use more than one anchor at a belay and rappel station. Your life depends on it. Beginner climbers are most vulnerable to accidents. Always use sound judgment Respect climbing dangers, don't climb over your head.
Keep in mind that anything you bring will add to the weight you will be carrying both up and down the mountain. If you can't manage it, you may need to rethink either your gear or the climb. If you are unfamiliar with the area, always bring along a compass, map, and guidebook. Don't rely on electronic devices to find your way, as their GPS signal could be lost through the mountains. So make sure you know how to use your compass. Always bring extra clothing that will keep you dry and warm just in case. The higher you climb, the closer you are to the sun, so sun protection is essential to your survival and health while at high altitudes. No matter how careful you are, accidents will happen so it's vital to be prepared. A basic first aid kit should be enough to help treat small wounds or injuries. A few tips to navigate. An outdoor disaster. 